Deutsch, uh, speaking on patterns of U.S. hegemony. Uh, Judy has a degree in history from UCLA, is a psychoanalyst, uh, active in, on the editorial board of Canadian Dimension, a former chair of Science for Peace, which is also sponsoring today's event. Okay, maybe coming from the United States, um, I'm not the same when uh, as you are. Um, and it's interesting that you um, uh, did speak about World War I because I, in my very introduction, I, I do allude to the um, World War I in, in terms of the unpredictability of, of uh, history. Sure. Okay, so <clears throat> the Ukraine Russia conflict was particularly ominous because it could escalate into a nuclear war. Yet the role of the United States is generally left out of the news, out of news reports and analyses. The political world is dangerously in flux right now with bilateral and multilateral military and economic alliances and a robust global arms trade, often shadowy, similar to the time of preceding World War I when it took one trigger to unleash cascading interstate violence. Emeritus Professor of Russian History Stephen Cohn has spoken um, frequently uh, about the Ukraine-Russian situation. He said, this is a horrific, tragic, completely unnecessary war in eastern Ukraine. <clears throat> in my own judgment, we have contributed mightily to this tragedy, meaning the United States. I would say that historians one day will look back and say that America has blood on its hands, a new Cold War. But here's the difference. Because NATO has expanded for 20 years, but it's been primarily a political expansion, bringing these countries of Eastern Europe into our sphere of political influence, but now it's becoming a military expansion. Now this decision brings NATO right plunk on Russia's, Russia's borders. Russia will then leave the historic nuclear agreement that Reagan and Gorbachev signed in 1987 to abolish short-range nuclear missiles. Where are, by the way, the nuclear abolitionists today? Where is the grassroots movement you know by freeze and sane? Because we're looking at a new nuclear arms race. Russia moves these intermediate missiles now to protect its own borders as the West comes toward Russia, and the tripwire for using these weapons is enormous. I, I, I'm going to conclude the, uh, my, my talk with a quote from uh, some, some thoughts by, from Elaine Scarry, but I'll just mention now that she's a Harvard academic who's worked a lot around abolition of nuclear weapons, and she comments on the fact that her students at Harvard, some of them have never heard of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. So, you know, there's the, the ignorance of the public is, is really very, very important here. Um, in a June 5th, 2015 report from Russia Today, um, they quote from the Associated Press, saying the Pentagon is considering scrapping a Cold War era treaty and deploying nuclear-capable intermediate-range cruise missiles in Europe over Moscow's alleged treaty violations. The uh, Associated Press reports that the U.S. administration is mulling deploying medium-range missiles in Europe and Asia that would be potentially capable of destroying military targets within Russian territory. This is citing an unclassified portion of a report written by the Office of General Martin Dempsey, Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. A number of critics decry the pro propagandistic framing of Ukraine-Russia as a black and white demonization of Putin, leaving out the culpability and danger posed by NATO nuclear weapons and patterns of U.S. hegemony. For example, I'll just quote a couple of people around this, uh, their comments about this. Marie Dobbin, um, um, of the Taiyi in Vancouver says, what are the consequences when elected governments make policy based on faith and imperial hubris instead of science and expertise? It's a question that is forcing itself on the world as we watch the United States, Britain, NATO, and the Harper government continue to up the ante in the confrontation with Russia over Ukraine. There are real enough geopolitical dangers in the world without actually creating them out of arrogance and ignorance, but that is where we are right now and consequences could be catastrophic. Canada, Britain, the U.S., and the boys with their toys in NATO headquarters are looking for a fight with Russia. Um, James Bissett, who was the former Canadian ambassador to, um, uh, to Yugoslavia. Yeah, Yugoslavia, that's right. Um, and I think Al uh, Albania, too, and, and Bulgaria. He said, 
The current crisis in Ukraine threatens global security <coughs> and at worst has the potential for nuclear catastrophe. At best, it signals a continuation of the Cold War. Sadly, the crisis is completely unnecessary and the responsibility lies entirely in the hands of the United States, led NATO powers. The almost virulent propaganda onslaught blaming Russia for the instability and violence in Ukraine simply ignores reality and the facts. The American Friends Service Committee writes, Corporate media outlets such as CNN, Fox News, and the New York Times have colluded with leaders in Washington to whip up a new Cold War sentiment against Russia while covering up the U.S. role in the recent violent events in Ukraine. Unmentioned by corporate media are the enormous U.S. financial and military interests at stake, from control of Ukraine's oil and gas pipelines connecting Russia with Western Europe to the prospect of NATO military bases on Russia's western border. Um, O'Hanlon, as a senior fellow at the Brooklyn Institution, um, wrote in, in Political Magazine, um, astonishingly writing uh, this about NATO. He says, to be sure, Russia should not object to the expansion of NATO, an organization that has no hostile intent, no significant deployment of military forces near Russia's borders, and a primary focus on consolidating democracy and peaceful norms within Europe. So that's what he said about NATO. <laughs> the Globe and Mail liberal columnist Doug Saunders writes this be bewildering piece, Divorced from Reality, in which he stated that Putin is to blame for the downing of flight MH17, regardless of who actually shot the plane <laughs> down, because, because Russia caused chaos in Ukraine. He wrote that all of Europe is under assault from Russia. That's from 2014. So I'm going to talk about um, four, four categories. NATO, um, nuclear weapons, patterns of U.S. hegemony, and economic strangulation. I'll try to talk quickly. <laughs> um, NATO was formed in 1949 as a defensive alliance against communism. In response, European communist states united under the Warsaw Pact six years later. When the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, Gorbachev and George H.W. Bush made a verbal agreement to allow the unification of West and East Germany under conditions that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. Shortly after, the Clinton administration staked out its stand, quote, that NATO should be able to act independently of the United Nations, end of quote. Unil and Clinton unilaterally decided to bomb Bosnia and soon after Serbia. The aim was not to put a stop to ethnic cleansing, to intervene in order to protect, but to preempt threats to the cohesion of NATO and the credibility of American power. Responding to the 1995 bombing campaign against the Bosnian Serbs, then Russian President Boris Yeltsin said, quote, this is the first sign of what could happen when NATO comes right up to the Russian Federation's borders. The flame of war could burst out across the whole of Europe. End of quote. But the Russians were too weak at the time to derail NATO's eastward movement, which at any rate did not look so threatening since none of the new members shared a border with Russia, save for the tiny Baltic countries. Strobe Talbot, Deputy Secretary of State under Clinton, strongly criticized NATO expansion. He said, Russia's resentment toward the United States and the crisis that erupted in March 2014 with Russia's occupation of Crimea were not unrelated to the Clinton administration's insistence in the 1990s that NATO be expanded to Russia's borders. It seemed like virtually everyone I knew from the world of academe, journalism, and foreign policy think tanks was against enlargement. George Kennan, um, who had been uh, for some time uh, the ambassador to the Soviet Union, was the author of the uh, policy of containment. Um, he termed enlargement a strategic blunder of potentially epic proportions. He said expanding NATO would be the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post Cold War era, he wrote. Such a decision may be expected to inflame the nationalistic, anti Western, and militaristic tendencies in Russian opinion to have an adverse effect on the development of Russian democracy, to restore the atmosphere of the Cold War to East-West relations, and to impel Russian foreign policy in directions decidedly not to our liking. Contrary to the verbal promise to Gorbachev to not expand NATO one inch, NATO did expand membership and NATO bases to the East. In 1999, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined NATO. 
Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia joined NATO in 2004. At the April 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest, the United States supported inviting Georgia and Ukraine to join the alliance. John Mearsheimer writes of the significant April 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest. The first, he said, was the first indication of what was to come. France and Germany opposed the move for fear that it would unduly antagonize Russia. In the end, NATO's members reached a compromise. The alliance did not begin the formal process leading to membership, but it issued a statement endorsing the aspirations of Georgia and Ukraine and boldly declaring, quote, these countries will become members of NATO. Russia made it clear that this was unacceptable, but NATO didn't back off. In May, the EU announced that there would be an Eastern Partnership. By August, there was war between Georgia and Russia. Georgia thought NATO would back them in a conflict with Russia, but they didn't. A little bit reminiscent of the Kurds' hope um, uh, in, in their, uh, war against, in their fight against uh, Iraq, when they hoped that the U.S. would help them. Afterwards, Obama failed to reset relations with Russia. The U.S. continued to pursue the policy of pulling Ukraine from the Russian orbit and integrating it into the West. NATO expansion continued, continued marching forward with Albania and Croatia becoming members in 2009. I want to say something about the organization of NATO. Um, this is from a recent book, a um, very interesting book by Michael Glennon, um, who analyzes the deep state. It becomes readily apparent, he said, that the U.S. executive is the sole organ in the federal government in the field of international relations. Executive decisions around military surveillance security do not require congressional approval. By the deep state, he variously describes the, the National Security Council bureaucracy, the National Security Council, and the National Security Team, a relatively small number of elite bureaucrats who make up the single most powerful staff in the United States. He writes that they define security in military and intelligence terms rather than political and diplomatic ones. This encourages this exaggeration of existing threats and the creation of imaginary ones. The setup is devoid of meaningful constraints, and this part is really important. He says, in fact, international law affords great deflective possibilities. The UN Charter and, NATO, and the NATO Treaty provide every useful cover. I think that's what um, Jeff Halper, if any of you know his work, and others call lawfare. It makes, makes making crime fit the law. The rules of the UN Charter concerning the use of force can plausibly be marshaled to support virtually any US military action deemed in the national interest. The NATO organization itself provides credibility, flexibility, and anonymity in equal doses. Its council has no substantive written rules of procedure. It issues no legal guidance or guidelines that might restrict member states. It exercises no standalone authority since member states have delegated none. No internal rules exist that would render NATO responsible for a violation of international law. The organization's policy is not to reveal which member state participated in the military operation. All of this gives NATO its greatest asset, its capacity to serve as a veil. NATO shields member states from legal and political accountability. There have been no congressional or parliamentary inquiries, no demonstrations outside embassies, and no legal actions threaten member states. Also, this new Cold War must be put into the context of what is happening in the Arctic, and Gray alluded to this in his introduction. This is also where Canada is important, as the West prepares for Arctic warfare. Heightened U.S. interest in the Arctic Ocean for energy, trans this heightened interest uh, by this um, for energy, transportation, and military purposes. There is a 36-page document released by the U.S. Department of the Navy called the Arctic Roadmap 2009. Here, here are the key components. The United States has broad and fundamental national security interests in the Arctic region. These interests include missile defense and early warning, deployment of sea and air navigation, and overflight to secure U.S. sovereign rights over extensive marine areas including the valuable natural resources they contain. In the document, the U.S. declares the territories within the Arctic Circle a zone of, of its strategic interest. NATO follows the American Arctic Initiative 
and proclaimed that the High North is going to require even more of the Alliance's attention in the coming years. The US, Canada, Denmark, and Norway were represented as founding members of the military bloc. Russia was not invited to send even an observer. The Russian news report wrote of the inescapable logic of the meeting. It said, NATO is seriously thinking of establishing military presence in the Arctic. It considers global warming and consequently an Arctic thaw as an occasion for this. NATO sees this as, an, as a possibility for its Arctic expansion. It is Canada that has been appointed the role of vanguard in the impending showdown with Russia over the Arctic. Ottawa has conducted its, its largest ever military exercises, established new bases, and exhibited increasing truculence, truculence and saber rattling towards Russia and the region. Washington and Brussels, meaning the EU, has employed Canada to confront Russia. U.S. and NATO radar, submarine, and missile deployments in the high north will complete the encirclement of Russia. Um, for my, I'm, I'm also a psychoanalyst, and I must make a, a comment on the, on the fact that psychopaths experience no tension or conflict about lying. Anders um, Fogras Moussen, former Secretary General of NATO, reported in Al Jazeera, quote, We are pretty close to the new Cold War because of Russia's illegal actions in Ukraine. I would say NATO is the most successful peace movement the world has ever known. He said that the accusation of encirclement of Russia is not justified, that NATO encirclement is not a threat against Russia, about the promise, about the promise to not move one inch further east, he said that view is pure propaganda. He said it's the right thing to expand. Each and every nation has the right to decide whether to join the alliance. Russia benefits from a zone of security. Encirclement is paranoid, he said. The root, cause, the root cause of the problem is Russian expansion. NATO expansion brings prosperity. <laughs> the current, um, current commander um, of NATO, is, is, his name is Breedlove. He announced, Strange Breedlove. <laughs> he announced that 40,000 Russian troops were massing on the border, but in the age of forensic satellite evidence, he offered, he offered real evidence about the um, about the mass of troops. This was reported in Der Spiegel. They said German leaders in Berlin were stunned. They didn't understand what Brilo was talking about, and it wasn't the first time. Once again, the German government, supported by intelligence gathered by Germany's foreign intelligence agency, did not share the view of NATO's supreme allied commander. The pattern has become a familiar one. For months, Brilo has been commenting on Russian activities in eastern Ukraine Speaking of troop advances on the border, the amassing of munitions and alleged columns of Russian tanks, over and over again, Reed Love's numbers have been significantly higher than those in the possession of America's NATO allies in Europe. I contrast this with the statement by Chomsky in um, on Democracy Now! Um, about the U.S. military equipment taking part in the military parade in Estonia. I think this was in February. Um, so he was commenting on this this military parade a couple hundred yards from the Russian border. He said, Russia is surrounded by US offensive weapons. Sometimes they're called defense, but they're all offensive weapons. And the idea that the new government in Ukraine that took over after the former government was overthrown last December, it passed a resolution of overwhelmingly, I think, something like eight, 300 to 8 or something, um, announcing its intention to take steps to join NATO. No Russian leader. No Russian leader, um, no matter who, who it is, could tolerate Ukraine right at the geostrategic center of Russia, Russian concerns, joining a hostile military alliance. Now, I can give you many examples, um, actually this year from February on to now, about uh, NATO deployments um, around Russia, but I'm going to say that in case there is time, because I want to get to some of the things. Um, uh, there's, there's uh, quite a lot of documentation and evidence of, of the deployments you know, right around Russia. So I want to talk now about nuclear weapons. Again, alluding to what uh, Greg talked about in, in the introduction. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists this year advanced their doomsday clock warnings of human extinction to three minutes before midnight. 
yet major meetings on eliminating nuclear weapons go unreported. This spring saw the UN Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, the New York Symposium, Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, and the Quebec World Uranium Symposium. So this is in the, just the past few months, and none of this has been reported in the media. The Non-Proliferation Treaty came into effect in 1970 and has two parts, non-proliferation and elimination of nuclear weapons. The actions belie words. In 2014, President Obama allocated $1.1 trillion for upgrading nuclear weapons over the next three decades. This spring, nuclear-equipped nations rejected calls to take nuclear weapons off high alert status, increasing the risk of accidental or impulsive nuclear war. Canada is a signatory to the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but Harper has violated the terms of the treaty by selling uranium to India, a, not, a nuclear weapons state that has not signed the treaty. Canada is a member of NATO, and NATO is in violation of the NPT by refusing to rule out offensive first use of nuclear weapons. Despite member states' commitment to transparency in the 2002, in the 2000 NPT final document, NATO does not disclose details about its nuclear weapons. Specific to the escalating nuclear threat, there is a historical pattern of U.S. action and previously USSR um, counter-reaction in the escalation of the arms race. For example, the first U.S. nuclear chain reaction was in 1942, and the first um, nuclear chain reaction in, in uh, USSR was in 1946. The first atom bomb was uh, 1945 the U.S., 1949 USSR. The accelerated buildup of strategic missiles was 1961 in the U.S. and 1966 the USSR. Multiple warheads on missiles was 1964 in the U.S., um, nine years later in the USSR. Computerized guidance on missiles 1970 and five years later in the USSR. The collapse of the Soviet Union heralded a sad history of might have been. In 1991, George H.W. Bush and Gorbachev signed the START Treaty to begin the process of eliminating thousands of nuclear weapons. But the U.S. simultaneously launched a massive assault on Iraq, stationing nuclear weapons in the Persian Gulf. More setbacks followed. George W. Bush unilaterally pulled out of the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty the cornerstone of nuclear weapons deterrence and international security. So he did that in 2002. Ballistic missile defense um, uh, is, uh, is widely recognized as the weaponization of space with highly destructive offensive weapons placed in or guided from space. The message is that no potential challenge to U.S. hegemony will be tolerated. The U.S. maintains the right of first use of nuclear weapons Missile defense and other military programs of the Bush and Obama administrations are inherently provocative to Russia and China. The 1998 U.S. Space Command concept of global engagement included space-based strike capabilities that would allow the U.S. to attack any country and to deny similar capability to any other countries. The threat to use nuclear weapons is itself a violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty according to the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. Yet this April, members of the European Parliament declared that the EU's readiness for nuclear war, quote, is one of the best steps to deter Russia from further aggression. Astonishingly, the Harper government just blocked a Russian delegation from attending an international conference in Ottawa aimed at stopping the spread of nuclear weapons. The United States has contingency, contingency plans for the use of nuclear weapons against both nuclear and non-nuclear states. Theodore Postal, MIT professor emeritus, recently wrote in The Nation, and I highly recommend you uh, look up his article, which is really excellent. Um, he, he wrote an article in The Nation that the danger of nuclear war is much higher now than in the Cold War. He notes the US false, the US false belief that a nuclear war is winnable that the U.S. recklessly treats nuclear weapons as if they're conventional, conventional weapons. Further, he writes that Russia has a fragile early warning system, leaving as little as six minutes to determine whether to launch a nuclear counterattack. Postal says that the Russians are aware of the, of the vulnerability in their system and are also aware of the United States' relentless preoccupation with building nuclear weapon systems. 
Postal rights, the nuclear weapons overhaul announced by Obama, focuses on improving the accuracy of long-range land and sea-based ballistic missile warheads, and on increasing the killing power. <laughs> okay, the killing power of other nuclear, uh, um, uh, the killing power of nuclear warheads. But a close analysis reveals a technically sophisticated effort to ready U.S. nuclear forces for direct confrontation with Russia. Sophisticated Russian analysts, especially those who understand the technical aspects of nu nuclear weapons, see the U.S. modernization drive as a disturbing indication that the U.S. military believes a nuclear war against Russia can be fought and won. Postal concludes that the modernization effort significantly increases the chances of an accident during an unpredicted and unpredictable crisis, one that could escalate beyond anyone's capacity to imagine. In terms of uh, the unpredictability aspect, I would also recommend uh, Eric Schlosser's book, Command and Control. Eric Schlosser is known for his work on, um, on food, fast food uh, nation, but uh, his, his book on command and control, if you, uh, if you have any, any sense of, of security, uh, you, should, you should read it in terms of the nuclear weapons world. Um, I just have probably half a minute now. I wanted to, um, in, the, uh, in my talk, also touch on the whole history of, of um, US, uh, U.S. involvement in regime change, which probably some of you are, are quite familiar with. Um, uh, so many of the same kinds of techniques uh, you know, were, have, have been used by, by um, Victoria Newland and, and uh, the $5 billion of, of investment in, in, in uh, destabilizing Ukraine. Um, Victoria Nolan, I think you should also know, is, is uh, married to um, Robert Kagan, who's one of the authors of the Project of the New American Century, and uh, was one of the main architects of the, of the intervention on Libya. Um, so I, I, I uh, maybe I'll just read one of those paragraphs. I also wanted to talk briefly about the economic strangulation. I can just say that pretty much one word. That according to the UK Guardian, there was a really interesting article um, about the, the uh, um, Saudi-US Saudi deal to, to uh, flood the world, um, the oil, world with oil to bring down the prices of, 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 um, of oil and uh, to really again to destabilize particularly Russia but also Iran and Venezuela. And uh, then there's a very interesting report from the Open Institute on, on um, the buying up of, uh, the privatization of buying up of, of um, agricultural, rich agricultural land in Ukraine. And of course the, um, the austerity, the IMF austerity, typical austerity um, arrangements with, with Ukraine. Um, uh, I'll just quote John Pelcher. <laughs> I was going to talk about John Pelcher, and Thomas Johnson, and, and uh, Don McMurtry, and what they did. But I'll just end with John Pelcher. Since 1945, more than a third of the membership of the United Nations, 69 countries have suffered some or all of the following at the hands of America's modern fascism. They have been invaded, their governments overthrown, their popular movements suppressed, their elections subverted, their people bombed, and their economies stripped of all protection. Their societies subjected to a crippling siege known as sanctions. Um, U.S. involvement in coups against democratically elected governments and the insulation of di dictators include the Shah of Iran, General Suharto in Indonesia, Batista in Cuba, Somoza in Nicaragua, Pinochet in Chile, Mobutu in Congo Zaire, Lobo in Honduras. Um, he also uh, writes about the late 20th century tortures, disappearance, death squads, military coup, and right wing pogroms against workers, peasants, and the educated in most Latin American countries. So um, we could talk a lot more. <laughs> but uh, I think it's, the message, of course, is, is that you can't just talk about Russia and Ukraine. You have to really look at the context of, of the United States and, uh, and, and NATO and nuclear weapons. <laughs>